Let's all sing together. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Give pray. Heavenly Father, we come before thee giving thanks for another beautiful day, another opportunity to come study your word. May we always listen attentively to the lessons that we're given, see how we can apply those to our lives, fix ourselves to do a better job of making you the light in our life and shining that light out to others. We know our first goal in life is to go to heaven, Lord, and we pray that we take others with us as well. There's many sick, many sympathy that we need to remember. We ask that you bless those families, those doctors, everyone that is helping to oversee those situations. 
do the do what we all hope and pray that can be done for those individuals, those families. We ask that you forgive us of our sins, watch over us in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious I asked the fellas to put this song up on the board where we could look at it. Uh, I hope you can see it. The writers of this 
song on a hill far away, had in mind to bring our focus on what was done at Mount Calvary. I'd like for us to think about the first line, and I'll try not to be too long here. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The cross during this time that when this part of our scriptures was written was a lot like the electric chair or the, the table where the medicine is administered to put a person to death. But when you look at it closely, it was a lot worse than that. Just as the cross itself was, as the song says, an old rugged piece of plunder, its purpose was that way. This is where the murderers were sentenced to die. This is where those who made insurrection among the government were brought to their end. And it wasn't just for the purpose of bringing them to their end. It was to make a spectacle On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. The person sentenced to die on the cross was subjected to just that, not just suffering, not just death, but shame. Our Lord Jesus, of all the people, did not deserve that kind of treatment. He didn't deserve to be spat upon. He didn't deserve to be slapped across the face. He didn't deserve the crown of thorns. He didn't deserve the, the nails in his hands and his feet. Several years ago, there was a lot of talk about who put him there. Who put him on that cross? And of course, the Jewish people said, not us. It was the Romans. Well, there are no Romans around like there were then to defend themselves, so it's easy to let it fall there. But I woke up thinking about this this morning. I put him there. We put him there. Were it not for our sinful state, he wouldn't have had to do that. But as it was, he did. And he did. He went to that old rugged cross, the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Pray with me, please. Our God and our Father, it's with grateful hearts we come to you in prayer, thanking you, Father, for this feast, these emblems that bring before us week by week, time by time, the precious sacrifice that you allowed your Son to make for us. We pray, Father, that you would bless this loaf, this bread which is to us a representation of the body that was given as sacrifice so that we might have an offering before you in time of sin. Please forgive us, Father, when we fail you and help us as we partake of these emblems, this bread, 
to allow our minds to drift back to that cross, to see the spectacle, and to know that all the humiliation and the pain that he suffered was for each one of us. And bless us, Father, and help us as we strive to live for you day by day. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Father God, we come before you now thanking you for this emblem of the blood that was shed at Calvary's cross. Thank you, Father, for the fruit of the vine that brings back to our minds regularly the fact that your son hung on that cross and bled and died so that we might have access to you and the salvation that you offer. Help us, Father, as we live our lives day by day to live under the, the cleansing of that blood, to constantly be in prayer about it and about our state before you. And help us, Father, to find ways of being what you want us to be as we live our lives for Jesus our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
communion service being ended now, we have opportunity to give of our means. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the good things that you make part of each of our lives. Help us, Father, to ever be more grateful to you for the place that you've given us in life. And help us, Father, to be open and outward in our living and in our giving with the church, but even more so with those around about us. And help us, Father, to share your love with them in all that we do. In Jesus we pray. Amen. To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tears. to mark at this time in your book, number 559, 559, have you been to Jesus, will be the song of invitation. If you're able and would like to stand, you may stand this time, we'll sing this song before the lesson.
just over in the glory land, and with kindred saved there forever be, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over Just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land. Be seated, please. Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you here. If you're visiting here with us, uh, we just want to let you know that you are our honored guest. And if you are visiting with us, we would also ask that there's a white card in the pew in front of you, or should be. Uh, if you have the opportunity, please fill that out and give that to one of us before you leave so we can have a record of your attendance and also give us a little bit of information so that we can reach you back. I do want to start this morning with an announcement. Joy Jacobson is home. Um, Ann called me, uh, I think it was yesterday, and wanted me to express to the congregation how much love that she has for each and every one of you. She said, I just want to say thank you so very much for all the calls, all of the visits, the, the prayers, everything of that nature. She said, I would not know where I would be without my church family. So thank you so much on her behalf. Now, as we get down into our lesson this morning, the truth about Christ's birth. During this season in the U.S., people of the world-type mind has been trying to force our minds into believing that this is the time of which we celebrate Christ's birth. And we start having different stories and different accounts and everything of the actual account that took place. You may have heard something about the traditional story about Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. There is no room for them in the end. Therefore, Mary gives birth and lays the baby in a manger. And that night they were visited by three wise men and the date was December 25th. Now, that's the traditional story. That's what we see. We have the nativity scenes and things like that all over our house. And, and things of that nature is what some people have. We see it out in people's yards. One of which I actually saw, and this was the very first I've ever seen this, Santa bowing down and taking care of little baby Jesus. Now, I've never seen that before in my entire life. But you see it. But as I mentioned as the title of this sermon, The Truth About Christ's Birth, would you be shocked to know that there is a difference in what the traditional story is and what the Bible actually says? I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Let's talk about the actual account in and of itself because did you know that this in respect to the events that actually took place there at the birth of Christ, this is the only account of any detail of anything that ever took place there at that account. If we look here at Luke chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1 and then after we go through all of this, then I've, I've got everything broken down in verses so we can pinpoint it all together. In verse number 1 of Luke chapter 2, it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while uh, Quintaria, uh, uh, <laughs> Quirinius was governor over Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the, day, uh, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, 
who was with child. So it, were, uh, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph, the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they, were wide, uh, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at, this, uh, at these things which were told, uh, told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. When you really break down this whole entire account, one thing that you'll find there is that Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem and Jesus is born and placed in a manger, which is actually a feeding trough. Because there was no room for them in the inn. There were shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, which is going to be very, very important here as we start looking at things a little bit later. The angel then appears to them, tells them of the birth of Jesus. The sign was given to them that they would find a child wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. At that particular time, the heavenly host appeared to them and started praising God. The shepherds go and find Jesus lying in the manger and made known what they were told. The shepherds then return glorifying and praising God. Now, where are the wise men? You don't see them. Right? Because you've got to go to another account. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Now, in respect to the exact account of all that took place at the birth of Christ, Luke chapter 2 is all you're ever going to find. But now you find over here in Matthew chapter 2 that there was, beginning in verse number 1, we're going to read verse... Through verse number 12. We read here, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all of the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ would be, was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Beth, uh, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them... What time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when, he, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. So they heard the king, uh, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which, uh, which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When, the star, uh, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, be, uh, then being divinely warned in a dream 
that they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. Now, I want you to say something just for a second. Where does the wise men fit in this whole entire account? Well, you find that wise men came from the east following a star to worship the king, and King Herod gets word. The chief priests and the scribes inquire of where Christ was to be born, and they told them that it was in Bethlehem according to the scriptures. Herod then inquires, what time, which by the way is very, very important. I want you to underline that in your Bibles. What time the star appeared and sends them away to find him so that, that he may come and worship him, which by the way, that was not his intent at all. He saw a threat. And therefore, he was wanting to murder, is what we're about to see here in a little bit. They come to the young child in the house. Now, underline that. Look at verse number 9, or verse number 11. And when they had come into the house, is that the manger? That's not what I read, right? They were to be seen in the house. It says there that... Uh, they began to worship him and presented three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wise men are then warned by God and departed back to their own land another way. That's all that's mentioned. But for some odd reason, we've, we've mixed certain things up in the traditional story of different accounts, different things, and start mingling those things together and make certain things fit that does not fit. Does that make sense? Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Where does it say three wise men? Did you read anything at all about that? All I see is that they presented three gifts. Now, could that not have been two wise men that basically brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Could it have been that? Could it have been a hundred wise men that showed up? Exactly. What's the number? More than one. That's all that's preferred. Men. So, with that being said, it's interesting, whenever you look at this just a little bit deeper, did you know that there's a way that we can actually predict the, the date around, or at least the region of the date that Jesus was actually born? Was it December 25th? Let's look at it a little bit deeper. How do we do this? In Luke chapter 1, and verse number 5, we read about John the Baptist's father, Zacharias. Zacharias, as what we read there in verse number one or verse number five of chapter one of Luke, we read there that there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, which is going to be very very important. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. In verse number eight, it goes a little bit further down with this. He says, "So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order." of his division. Now, to understand really what we're talking about, he's from the tribe of Abijah, and it, there was a priestly order of everything that they would do. Well, you have to go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 24. And in this, verses 7 through 19, they casted lots on the different tribes and trying to figure out what order they were going to be serving as priests. Now, this is interesting. As you look down here in verse number 9, or actually verse number 10, you'll read here, and the 8th to Abijah. Okay, so he served in the 8th of the 24 of the order of, of them going through the cycles of the priesthood. Now, in verse number 19, you'll read at the very bottom right here that this was the schedule for their, of the service for coming into the house of the Lord according to their ordinance by the hand of Aaron their father as the Lord God of Israel had commanded them. You do a little bit deeper study into the date of when he actually did that. Well... You've got to look at how the priesthood all served. There were 24 different divisions for rotation. They served from one Sabbath to the other Sabbath. They served two times a year on their rotation. And it was 168 days in between each service time. Now, why is that so important? Well, I did a little bit of digging. And this right here is the division of how they ran their rotations. And what you see right here 
is that being the eighth, you're talking about the eighth week. So that falls into the second month, which simply is the IR month. Now, six months later, or 168 more days later, you find there in Teshran is whenever he would serve his second time. Then you go a little bit further into this. Now, what's so important with this? Because it was whenever he served his time as priest, whenever he went in to serve the incense there in Luke chapter 1. That's when the angel came to Zacharias and told him that Elizabeth, even though she was barren, was going to have a child. Now, as soon as he come out of his priesthood, what did he do? They, can, they conceived John the Baptist. How old was John the Baptist whenever Jesus was conceived? Six months. How do we know that? You look a little bit further into Luke chapter 1 and also Luke chapter 2 and you'll find the dating of that being the six months older. Okay? Whenever she came to him, John the baptizer being six months in the womb, all of a sudden it said, and the babe leaped within her womb. Okay? So, understanding six months, all of a sudden you have a time frame. Six months after this, you'll get this month right here of a possibility of him, which actually falls between November and December. Oh, December 25th, right? Uh, let's look a little bit deeper at this. Six months after this, if it was on this rim right here of his order, of where he uh, got word that Elizabeth was going to do to be uh, receiving a child, you'll find there that nine months after that falls actually on June or July. Now, how do we dig a little bit deeper into this? Well, you've got to look at certain other evidences. If you look at Luke chapter 2 and verse number 8, remember how I said about the shepherds, it's going to be very, very important. Okay? In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 8, we read there that now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. Now, I want you to notice this. Living out in the fields, on top of that, keeping watch over their flock by night. Where were the shepherds? In the field, at night, laying with their sheep. Now, do you believe, and this is what's so important about this, I did some other digging on all of this, and the care of shepherds during the Palestinian type lifestyle. It says in the springtime there is an abundance of green pasture, and usually the sheep are allowed to graze near, the, uh, near to the village where the shepherd's house is located. In late autumn or winter months, there are times when the shepherds can find no pasture that is available for his flock, and then he must become responsible for feeding his animals himself. Okay, just like what it is today. In the, in the autumn and winter months, typically we're the ones that bringing out the hay bales, okay, to feed our livestock and things. Nothing different in Palestine. But notice this, where were the shepherds? The shepherds were in the field, lying at night with their flock. Now watch this. You look at the temperature. The average temperature during June or July was somewhere around 60 degrees. Okay? If it was in December, it would be 40 degrees. Do you think a shepherd would be out with his sheep lying outside at night with 40 degree weather? More than likely, no. Okay? No. The interesting part, they were out there during the months of the grazing. During the springtime, which would also fall also into the summer months, you would also find warmer weather, but also grazing that was able to be done because there was flourishing of grass. You wouldn't have that in the winter months. So, looking a little bit deeper with this. What is the probable date for the actual birth of Christ? What's the actual date? We don't have it. Now, can we suppose certain things according to the evidences that has been given to us? Absolutely. I've narrowed everything down. It would have had to have been in June or July because of the environment with the shepherds, with his order, and things of that nature. So it's pretty interesting, right? Now, here's the point. When you start looking at a little bit deeper with this, the religious world out here today is trying to say, well, we have the right to celebrate the birth of Christ. I want to ask you, where in Scripture does it ever say anything about, I want you 
to on December 25th, I want you to celebrate the birth of Christ. Where do you find that authority? Do you find it? You don't find it. So here's the point. If God authorizes, and some of you may be thinking, well, I just don't care. Okay? Here, here, here's the thing. If we have that mentality of I just don't care, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, that's a lot deeper issue than, than just Christmas. Okay? Do you believe that God has the ability to authorize a day that he wants us to observe? Has he done it? As he said on the first day of every week, I want you to come together and break bread. Did he say that? To remember what? His death. Because that is something that means everything to us. Now, did our Lord have to come to this earth? Absolutely. Did he have to be born? Absolutely. Did he come in a miraculous way? Absolutely. That's not, my, that's not the argument. But I want you to ask yourself this question. According to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, we read there, And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of our Lord. Right? So I want to ask you this one question. Now, I know in times past I've asked you this question, does all mean all? Yeah. It, do we have the authority to do certain things that God has not authorized? No, we do not. So can we then pinpoint, well, it's, it depends on what it is and if I like it and if I want to observe it. It doesn't change anything at all. All means all. For everything that we do, if we have the authority to do so, and that even comes down to, um, to just doing everyday life situations... The very first thing that should be in our minds is what does God have to say about it? Does he give me freedom to do that or does he not? Because here's the thing. If God wants us to celebrate or make any other religious day a holiday, a holy day, God has the ability to do that. He has been, he's already given the Jews the, the, uh, the three feast days that he said I want you to do, right? Does he have the ability to describe what he wants? Has he done it in the past? So where is celebrating the birth of Christ in the Christian age? We don't have it. We, we had the same authority for celebrating Christmas as a religious day. Just as, hey, let's go ahead and celebrate the day of Jesus' baptism. Or whenever he healed the man in the pool of Siloam. Or whenever he healed the blind Bartimaeus. Let's go ahead and celebrate that day. Do we, do we say, will we do that? I mean, that, that, those are all great days, right? I mean, it's miraculous days in which he, he, he went against the laws of nature and healed certain individuals. Those, that's just simply amazing, right? A man who was born blind to all of a sudden be able to see just like that. It's amazing. Just as we don't have the authority to go ahead and make those certain days a religious holiday observed by Christians, neither do we have the authority to celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday. So then what do we do for Christmas? We celebrate Christmas as a family day to get together as family. The mirrors yesterday. Did you see that picture on Facebook? There was about 45 of them, was it not, Lisa? 45 of them. That was here in our fellowship hall, just celebrating a family get together, and that's what it's all about. But to to make it a religious holiday to celebrate the birth of Christ, my friends, we have no authority to do that, because if if we have the if, if God wanted us to do that, do you think He would have said it? He has the ability. So it really comes down to: Are we going to actually respect His authority? Or not. So, whenever you think about the fallacies of the traditional story that we talk about Christmas and, and Christ's birth, the date they have wrong, the people they have wrong, there was no wise men there at the manger scene, nothing even emphasizing only three, but only shepherds. You think about no authority. 
multiple different things. But here, here's the way I want to end my lesson this morning. I know this morning was more of just an informational type lesson, but we can apply it in this way. May we focus on the real life changing matter, not becoming distracted. Here's the point. You know how, and this even goes even for Easter. We celebrate Easter, right? Talking about the resurrection of our Lord. Where does he say to celebrate his resurrection? We don't have it. So, but, but here's the point. We celebrate the death and the burial and resurrection every first day of the week. And I love what, what Lloyd did this morning with the Lord's Supper. It was excellent. It was excellent. Because that's what we're celebrating. That's what we're reminding ourselves. Because here's the point. This manger scene over here demands nothing of us. Did you know that? But this demands everything from us. So which one do you think we need to be focusing on? The thing that does not matter or the thing that demands everything from us? Which one do you think matters the most? May we learn not to be distracted, brethren. And here's the point. Yes, our Lord, according to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he, he was miraculously born from a virgin. Beautiful, beautiful prophecy of beautiful fulfillment. Something that was against nature. Pure. But friends, we simply don't have the authority to make that a religious holiday. The only religious holidays that God authorizes on the first day of every week. That's it. But as much as the birth of Christ was life changing for us, the death of Christ is the most important thing. And that's what he wants to us to remember. So when we think about the death of Christ, Christ came, he died so that we might have a chance. But that chance has been given to each and every one of us on an equal, equal platter. But the choice is actually ours. Will we listen to the death of Christ to say that I want to take part in what he was actually purposely coming down here to earth to do? Because here's the point. It, it, there was an eternal purpose made within Christ. And the eternal purpose was not to be born but to die. To save mankind from their sins. So the question I want to ask you this morning is this. Do you want to have the salvation from your sins? If you have never obeyed the gospel, that's what I want to plead with you this morning. If you want to walk away here free, you can. How do you do that? By hearing his word, Romans 10 and verse 17. By believing Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John 8 verse 24. By repenting of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. By confessing his sweet name, Acts 8 verse 37. Being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. Now if you are willing to do that, I want to plead with you that you do that this morning. Because your soul is at stake and we do not want to chance anything. But if you have done that in times past, Christ came to this earth to die for our sins so that once we have that blood, we can constantly have access to that blood which continuously washes over us. But notice what he says, if we walk in the light, then will that blood continue to wash over us. The point is this, brethren, may we be faithful to God, be faithful to Christ. Because if we have been unfaithful, he says, if we, if we confess our faults, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're willing to come back, confess your faults, and ask God to forgive you, he will love you, he will wrap his arms of love around you, and he will forgive you. But if you need to come to him, we hope and pray that you'll do that right now as together we stand and as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? in the
Are you washed in the 